it became crystal clear to me that the bus would stop, right? And I'd get on whatever the opportunity was, but that if my skin color had been different, if I had been born in a different zip code, um, that bus would not have stopped. That bus would have gone right on by. And I think, you know, as I think about my own responsibility and how much more I can do and how much more I should do, right, to extend that umbrella of privilege and what does that mean and why are so many people not included under that umbrella of privilege. This episode of the Smart Athlete Podcast is brought to you by Solpre. If you're active at all, whether you're running or simply out walking for the day, you've probably experienced one of the number one problems that active people have, and that's chafing. Solpre's all new, all natural anti-chafe balm solves that problem while feeding your skin the vital nutrients it needs to be healthy. If you'd like to stop chafing once and for all and treat your body right, Go to Solpri.com to check out the anti-chafe balm today. And that's S-O-L-P-R-I.com. Welcome to the Smart Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse Funk. My guest today was a Olympian in the 1992 Olympics uh, competing in rowing. She is an award-winning documentary film director, the founder and CEO of 50 Eggs, Inc., an independent film production company. You can find her on Instagram at Mary Masio. Welcome to the show, Mary Masio. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining me. Um, for you, the listener, we'll be a little bit more brief uh, today. Mary's got lots of things to do, uh, so we'll do the speed version. Um, <laughs> Grant Grant Hill and I are working on a on a new film, so we got yeah lots hopping around here. Yeah, and it's I, so. Thank you very much for spending time with me. Um, so we'll we'll jump right in uh just the first question i'm interested in is how do you make the shift from uh athlete to filmmaker because i think if i unless i'm mistaken you were in law previously so those things at least in my own brain don't really have a venn diagram where there's an intersection i guess maybe you're right in the center but but how, <laughs> how does how does that occur so i you know i was in law school right and training and um honestly just had an amazing opportunity to uh you know when when you go to these camps you're supposed to be like napping in between your three days right especially in the lead up to the games uh, and i would be writing and so i actually had a couple screenplays that were bouncing around hollywood and, and long story short i made a short film i was going to film school on the sly starting my legal career and um, and I remember the class responding really dramatically, and that was became my very first film, A Hero for Daisy. So I was on maternity leave. I go make this thing, you know, like just uh, was a crazy time. I'm having a baby. I'm you know birthing this film, and uh, the film ended up going from zero to sixty in ways that none of us behind it could have ever imagined. And and it chronicled and you know in the year the 50th anniversary of Title IX, one of the most amazing Title IX stories, and there are many, um, but uh, few pale in comparison to, uh, many pale in comparison to what the Yale women did in 1976 around catalyzing awareness for athletic directors across the country. What is Title IX? What exactly does it mean? What is gender equity? And here are these women rowers, and here I am a rower, you know, this rowing, this rowing team at Yale that effectively stormed the athletic director's office and they, you know, dropped their sweats and had Title IX on naked bodies in blue marker. And, you know, I was a little girl at that time and I had never heard the story. I ultimately went to a women's college, Mount Holyoke. I went, you know, I was on the Olympic team and I'm like, how did I miss this story? And, and the only reason I found out about it is because I was sharing a house with this veteran and her name was Chris Ernst. And she was one of the lead protagonists of this way to create social change. And I remember she told me the story and I laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. And who knew that that would actually be my very first film. And, and that film, you know, New York Times, you know, half a page later, um, it was extraordinary what happened in the wake of that project. And so, 
that really launched my career. And, um, and, and I, you know, once you're a lawyer, like you're already gonna, you're always gonna suffer the barrage of lawyer jokes. But, um, you know, I think really strategically about all of our films and I would never regret the legal uh, practice that I had or the opportunity. Um, and funny enough, coming full circle, um, I worked almost, I think my entire, almost my entire, you know, legal career for Brown Redneck. Um, I created this film called I Am Jane Doe. So I worked on this film, I Am Jane Doe, which ultimately catalyzed bipartisan legislation. It's that legislation that my old firm is now using on behalf of young children who were victimized on Pornhub. And so like, how crazy is that to kind of come full circle? So in any event, I've been like knock on, you know, knock on wood, um, had just extraordinary opportunities a a along the way to be part of a journey of a number of different stories that, uh, you know, I, I sort of view what I do is I build the risers in the amphitheater, right? And, and whoever's voice it is like amazing that we can kind of create a sounding board where that, that voice or series of voices can just be amplified. I mean, you've got, you've got the option as I guess as a creative individual, your 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 palette is blank, your canvas is blank, right? So you can technically focus on anything you want, right? So why why focus on the particular subjects that you end up spending all this time on? Because I mean, making making any kind of film, let alone the films that you make, is a big undertaking. I, I'm <laughs> to, to, to put it to, to put it mildly, huge, huge, and. Honestly, like each film has had a different rationale, right? And so the my very first film, you're cobbling this thing together and I'm about to have a baby girl. What does it mean for her to be out in the world, right? And so in many ways, my first film was for her, uh, her name is Daisy, uh, but for other little girls just like her, mm -hmm. right? That it's okay to go out, get dirty, explore your limitations and you don't necessarily notwithstanding the media all around us have to conform to that like highly idolized notion of beauty mm -hmm. right which is typically white a blonde leggy right and right. um and 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 you know so in any event that's how that started all of my other projects sometimes uh people have come to me you know my most recent film a most beautiful thing uh, the protagonist of that story, which is out of the west side of Chicago, actually tweeted at me, and I and then my phone rings, and I had no idea the journey that would take me on. And when somebody like Arshay Cooper out of the west side of Chicago, with an amazing story out of the west side of Chicago, calls and says, "Would you?" Uh, there is no other answer but yes. And so again, sometimes it is just the most extraordinary stories that uh, become for me a responsibility in many ways. So each, um, each film that we've worked on, for us, you know, in the beginning, I thought, oh, I'm gonna write these screenplays and I'll have a chair with my last name and a black leather jacket and, you know, I don't smoke, but I can like fake it. And, um, and, Little did I know that I would have an opportunity in this world of documentary filmmaking and every project that we work on, it's all about how do we move the needle on a social issue. And so we really roll up our sleeves and we dive in and then what's the strategy for change and how are we thinking about bringing the left and the right together. And so we focus on those things and we don't really pay much attention to sort of awards or like the glitter piece of it. Although we do often work with uh, famous people or actors or celebrities, um, but it's all mission driven. How do we think about the issue at hand and how do we bring just our skill set and talents to, to really think about forward momentum on that? What I think is interesting or, or I don't know, almost, almost, I guess I'll say universal. I'll, I'll make a, a, a generalization here. It feels like it's much easier to communicate um, an issue through a story, be it real or fictionalized, than it is to like necessarily let's report the facts of what happened. Like there's something about film or, or television, something that, that's on the screen. I, I feel like when you get it 
cut right and then you know it's scored and, and everything's working like there's something that I think helps move you more than simply the, the story being recounted to you like verbally well it's a different exercise right it's a creative right. um it almost bypasses the brain and goes directly to your heart it's an emotional experience that people can have in the theater and one of the things we learned with um, A Most Beautiful Thing, another project that I worked on with, with Grant Hill, the Winklevoss brothers, um, a number of people stepped, stepped in to be supportive on A Most Beautiful Thing, um, was that notion that you can spend 90 minutes in the shoes of somebody that you may, that may come from a zip code that you never have visited, never have contemplated, and may have certain preconceptions about the people located in that zip code. And, you know, at the end of the day, we're all human. There are beautiful aspects to every person, every story. There are challenging and traumatic aspects, right? And yet um, there are many voices of many segments of our population that just simply aren't heard. And so how do we think about that and what's our role, you know, around that? And particularly a most beautiful thing, you know, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Right. The film itself became incredibly resonant. If you had said to me, what journey do you think you're going to go on? And then what one did you go on? Um, two profoundly different, you know, the exploration of privilege, the exploration of this notion of profound inequality of safety that exists in this country, right? Everybody talks about the income gap or achievement gap, but nobody talks about the simple nature of inequality of safety and how that affects children. And so when you go to a place like the West Side, you know, people in privilege make certain assumptions like those people join gangs, right? That's a fundamental sort of like going in assumption that many uh, people in the world of privilege have. In fact, there is no, often no such active choice right? A young person is navigating these worlds at 10, 11 years old. How am I going to get off my block to go to school safely? And what a lot of people don't realize is there is no active choice, right? There's right. how am I going to survive? And then the second piece, somebody told me later, that was like, you're just identified by where you live, period, full stop, mm -hmm. right? In terms of territory. And when you think about that, right, like that's not an active choice that, that young people are making. And so we've seen, you know, a most beautiful thing um, and especially Arshay Cooper really just, you know, capture hearts and minds around um, the profound lack of access and opportunity uh, that exists for so many of our citizens in this, in this country. And yet talent is equally distributed. Talent is and intelligence and humor and capability and work ethic evenly distributed, right? And it's just, why is it that opportunity only comes to those in the world of privilege by and large? The, I mean, the, the first thing I thought of when I, I saw the filmography for I mean, Most Beautiful Thing and was watching the trailer, I couldn't help but think of uh, a previous guest of Keel Abdullah, um, back on episode 93 of the show. I don't know if you're familiar with Akil. Oh yeah, um, he's a, he's a okay. pal. And I was like, I would assume you're, you're probably yeah. familiar with him. This, well, he, you know, not, only, not only that, but he became, became, as he will say, a wingman to the entire project. And Akil is the board chair of the Most Beautiful Thing Inclusion Fund. Yes. Um, it was extraordinary philanthropy in the wake of the Most Beautiful Thing. And so Akil has really stepped up um, around how do you think about a sea change of our sport, rowing, which right. has been affiliated for so long with, you know, the Harvards, the Yales, um, and how do you make the sport, which is unique around conflict resolution, yes. which is unique around repetitive motions for healing trauma, right? Like mm -hmm. the, our sport is unique in many ways, how do we create greater accessibility for, for those that, uh, that don't have access? So that's been a really exciting project to, to move along the spectrum with, with uh, Akil. Yeah, I, that's something I talked with him about back on that episode. If you, so if you want to dive deeper into that with Akil and me, it's episode 93. But yeah, I, I, we had talked a lot about, like, again, accessibility, like how <laughs> there's equipment, you, you need bodies of water, like there, you know, how do you make the sport more accessible to a, a wider range of people 
full stop, let alone yep. uh, under underserved communities. So it's yeah. a huge undertaking and challenge. And he seems like um, both a wonderful human, but also probably a great representative of, of the sport. Well, yes. And he was uh, the first African-American man right. um, to become an Olympian in the sport of rowing, right? We had Anita de France in 1976. Um, uh, on the women's side, but Akil was the first and he was in 2000. So, um, and, it, it, you know, on top of everything else, he is the genuine deal, right? Like mm -hmm. he is so thoughtful and cares deeply about these issues and he's funny and he's warm and, you know, all of those things. And so, you know, he has been just a great leader around the philanthropy that's happened. And of course, Arshay Cooper himself, let this past year put 2,500 young people of color on the water in brand new boats around the country. And he had me go to Newark with him and to see a community that had African-American mothers pouring champagne over brand new boats that these communities simply don't get or have access to I was blown away. Like personally, I was like, wow, Arshe, you are making things happen. And how lucky am I to be along, just tagging along in all of this, right? Like it was just su such a moving experience. And Arshe is a very, very powerful uh, person in terms of the work that he's doing. And I, th I think I read that you're now adapting the story to a series. Is that right? Uh, so Amazon Studios actually um, optioned the both the documentary and Arshay's book uh, to develop a scripted series. So it doesn't mean right like you still have to be greenlit and all that goes right, right, right. with that, but it's it's a very exciting process. So we'll see where that all nets out, but very excited to be part of that effort as well. Mary, I, this is a hard. Uh, juxtaposition, but I can't help but asking, there's a cello sitting behind you. Do you play the cello or is it there? Yeah, the no, I, well, I did play the cello for years, uh, which means I'm just a pain in the ass to my composer and you know, <laughs> all, the, all the, the team that works on the music score for our films, because I, I know just enough about music. I was classically trained and, mm -hmm. and know just a, enough that I'm just so, you know, anal and meticulous and a real pain in the ass, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, can, can I bother you to play anything or is, or is it, are you not tuned yeah, no, up? No, no, that, I think the bridge may have even fallen down. I'm not sure. Uh, so. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm a violinist. So I, I just see, I like see classic instrument and I go, that's cool. It's, it's time yeah. to jam. Like, let's, <laughs> let's <laughs> look right up. I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> so it is, it's just the, I guess I'll say the process um, with uh, the, the series, is that the, is that the current thing? Do you have stuff coming up on the plate you're looking at? Yeah, you, anything no, you can discuss? We have, we have a number of projects. One, we're actively in production on, uh, it's an indigenous project we've got, which I'm working on with Grant um, and uh, a number of others. Um, there are several projects in the pipeline. I can't say too much, but all really, um, uh, three of them, in fact, sports related. So really, really fun to go back to those roots. Um, so yeah, that's what's, that's what's cooking. It's never a dull day around, you know, 50 eggs. Uh, that's our company and, um, and really indebted, honestly, to the team of people that make these things happen. I know you're, a little squeeze for time today, so I don't want to run you too too late. Um, each person I interview for each particular season I do, I have a singular question that I ask each and every guest for that particular season. Um, and I think you've got plenty of these, so I'll ask you the question for this season, and that is, how do you celebrate your wins? <laughs> you need to do it, right? <laughs> because the obstacles are fast and furious, right? the down days, the hardships, the challenges, um, too many to count. And, you know, life is short and you have to celebrate the wins, even if they're little wins, um, because that's what it's all about. And for me, how do I celebrate wins? That's, that's really depends on the definition of what you call win, 
You know, when I can go to a place like Newark and see Arshea Cooper do his magic, and I know that the film has catalyzed some of that visibility for him, that's a win, right? When, um, when you see a CEO's uh, mind sort of expand around certain notions, that's a win. Right. Um, we have big wins and little wins. You know, one of our films catalyzed bipartisan legislation. That's a huge win. Right. Uh, another one of our films, we partnered with the Obama administration and the film ultimately raised. Uh, this was a, a film about undocumented students that built a robot and kicked the shit out of MIT. Right. Just a great, great uh, David and Goliath story. And that film ultimately raised more than $100 million with the White House um, in public and private partnerships with companies that were pledging uh, to donate monies for uh, STEM initiatives for underserved students. Um, and for the listener, you know, that was Underwater Dreams, yes. Yeah, 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 that was Underwater Dreams. That's a huge win. When you can motivate third parties to kind of like Let's dig in. Let's all try and move this wheel together um, in a way where there's more access, more opportunity. And, you know, I, uh, I didn't come from money, but I'm white. And that necessarily means I come from privilege, right? And I have been given opportunities that I know had my skin color been different. Simply, you know, my mother used to say, um, Mary, you're always there when the bus comes. And I never really used to know. I'm like, okay, she thinks I'm like super lucky. Like, you know, and, and, and you know, in the context, especially after A Most Beautiful Thing, it became crystal clear to me that the bus would stop, right? And I'd get on, whatever the opportunity was, but that if my skin color had been different, if I had been born in a different zip code, um, that bus would not have stopped. That bus would have gone right on by. And I think, you know, as I think about my own responsibility and how much more I can do and how much more I should do, right, to extend that umbrella of privilege and what does that mean and why are so many people not included under that umbrella of privilege? Uh, because, you know, we're, it's just luck that we are born in the circumstances that we are. And as my friend uh, Raphael used to say, you know, your location should not determine your destination. And, you know, out of the mouths of, boy, he was 17 when he said that to me in our, our film 1098, uh, Raphael Gordon, and um, how true it is. Mary, uh, if people want to see what you're up to, check out the films, any of that kind of stuff, where, where can they do that? Yeah, thank you. Come to 50eggs.com. We, um, a Most Beautiful Thing is streaming on both Amazon and Peacock. We had a great uh, relationship with uh, Comcast, NBC Universal, doing a whole host of, of different events. Um, and we just remastered our very first film, A Hero for Daisy, to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Title IX. And that is also on our website, 50eggs.com. And, you know, come by, you know, buy a T-shirt. Uh, we do... Um, uh, we have a very significant philanthropic commitment on the tail end of these sort of socially impactful projects that I'm really proud of. But, you know, for us, it's one foot in front of the other. And, you know, how do we move forward in a way where we can, you know, for me, it's how do I take the skills and the bless blessings of privilege that I've been accorded, you know, like, how do I use that for others? And, and without sounding sanctimonious, right? But but I think being on this journey during a most beautiful thing with R. Shea Cooper, it really, um, it really made me think how much more can I do? Because there is more that I can do on a personal level and, and that I should do. So yeah, that's the goal to be a better person. Awesome. <laughs> Every Mary. day. Yeah, right. All um, right, man. Thank, thank you for having me, Jesse. Great to see you and yeah. onward and upward. Thank you so much.